All right, guys, welcome back to part two of enzymes. Um, in this part, we're going to talk about some factors that affect enzymes and make them either turn off or not function or turn on and activate. So we're going to start by talking about inhibitors. And inhibitors are molecules that stop the function of an enzyme. A lot of times I think it's easy to think of this as a bad thing, and sometimes it is a bad thing. Um, like lactose intolerance is the inability of the enzyme lactase to break down lactose. But in some cases, it's actually a good thing to turn off or deactivate an enzyme because you don't want to be digesting things that you don't need to be digesting right now um, or building things that you don't need to spend energy building on. So your body's really good at making sure that only specific things are using energy at specific times and inhibitors can prevent that from you know, getting out of control or burning up your energy on things that you don't need to burn energy on right now. So there are two types of inhibitors and they are competitive and non-competitive. Um, competitive means that the inhibitor is gonna compete with the substrate. So it's gonna make it so that the substrate can't bind with the enzyme because the active site of the enzyme is blocked. So competitive means that the substrate cannot bind with the enzyme because the inhibitor blocks the active site. That's one way that the enzyme can be turned off. The other way the enzyme can be turned off is with non-competitive inhibitors, and that means the substrate will bind somewhere else on the enzyme, but remember that protein folding is like a very sensitive process. So if you attach something else to the protein, it will alter the shape because of the different chemical attractions between the different atoms. So what will happen is when the inhibitor binds, it actually changes the shape of the active site so that the substrate can't bind, even though the active site isn't actually blocked. So if I'm going to put this in words, it would be that the substrate cannot bind with the enzyme because the inhibitor oops, inhibitor changes the shape of the active site. So either way, the enzyme is going to be turned off and not going to be able to modify the substrate. So in the picture, these green molecules are the inhibitors. This one would be competitive on the top. I keep writing B's where there should be H's. Inhibitor. And same thing here, this is the inhibitor. So it, on the bottom, it's altering the shape, and on the top, it's literally blocking. Okay, so on the flip side of that, there are things that can help the enzyme turn on or be stabilized so that it continues to do its job. And those are things called cofactors. So cofactors are molecules that stabilize the shape of the active site so that the substrate can bind. So here in this picture, you can see an enzyme that is not the right shape for our I-shaped substrate. Um, so it would be turned off because it wouldn't be a match for the substrate. 
um, a cofactor, which is right here, can actually bind and that, again, the like chemical interactions and bonding, the covalent bonds, the ionic bonds, the hydrogen bonds um, between the cofactor and the enzyme actually refold the enzyme and cause the shape to be the correct shape for the enzyme to actually bind with the substrate. So that would be a cofactor. Cofactors turn enzymes on, inhibitors turn enzymes off. Okay. So along with this, there are some other factors that can impact enzymes that are out in the environment. Um, and mostly they are temperature and pH. So high temperature has a really big impact on an enzyme's ability to work. And basically what happens is high temperatures, let's zoom in here, temps cause proteins, tertiary structure, to unfold so that the enzyme can no longer function. Um, and this is actually the reason why having a really high fever for a really long time is super dangerous because it can actually cause the protein to unfold um, the enzymes in your body and make it so that your enzymes can't function. And if too many of your enzymes can't function, you actually will die from that because like I said in the last video, um, without your enzymes, all the reactions in your body would take place too slowly to actually keep you alive. So an example is that um, when someone has a high fever, their enzymes can denature. So now is the time for me to talk about this word denature. I'm going to go over here to where I have set up a place for it. Um, denaturing means that the protein loses its shape completely and therefore cannot function. Now, if a protein denatures, if an enzyme denatures, it can sometimes go back, renature into the correct shape, and then it will start to work again. Um, but if you have a high fever for a super long time and your proteins start to denature, it might be too late once they start to renature um, because your fever would have to drop. So there you go on that. Um, so denaturing is a bad thing because it's not like an inhibitor where you're just turning off the enzyme. It's like you're turning off the enzyme forever and you like maybe didn't mean to. So it's bad news. Okay, so low temperatures, on the other hand, do not denature enzymes, but they do just cause reactions to move a lot slower. So a low temperature will cause reaction rate to greatly decrease, which um, means the enzyme isn't functioning as well. Um, and less substrate is getting broken down or built up. So low temperatures aren't great either. The other thing that really can affect proteins and enzymes is pH. And pH is a measure of how acidic or basic um, something is. So typically we, we say that acids are worse for proteins. So acids are low pHs. which is from a pH of zero to a pH of like 6.99 forever. Um, seven is neutral. So that's your 
your acidic solutions. Um, the closer you get to zero, the more acidic you become. So your stomach pH is about two, super, super acidic. Um, and your blood is about seven, so very neutral. Um, acids cause denaturing of enzymes. So again, same thing as high temperatures, unfolding and loss of function. Bases, on the other hand, are high pHs. So they are from 7.1, 7.01 really, um, to 14. Um, and again, the closer you are to 7, the more neutral you are. So those would be weaker bases. And as you get to 14, those are things like drain cleaner and bleach. Um, obviously not good for you, just like a strong acid. So bases do not typically cause denaturing, but they do like reduce. The so I'll say um, strong bases can reduce enzymes function but do not have as big of an impact as acids. Um, and there you go. So temperature and pH have really big effects on enzymes. When we think about this, um, a lot of times we'll use a graph to demonstrate kind of where the enzyme works best. The last thing for this, but different enzymes have different optimal or optimum, either one, conditions. Optimal means best. So the optimal conditions are the I'm going to zoom into this. Optimal conditions are the temperatures and slash or pHs where the enzyme functions the fastest. Because that's the goal for an enzyme is to break down things or build things up as fast as possible. So you want them to be working at a super fast rate. Now, this very much will depend on the enzyme and where it's meant to work. So enzymes that are meant to work in your stomach will actually work pretty well in a super acidic environment. Enzymes that are in heat loving bacteria that live under the ocean by hydrothermal vents are gonna be built to work at really high temperatures. So even though in the last section of this video, I said that temperature, um, high temperatures and low pHs or acids are bad for enzymes, it's kind of like a, there are exceptions, which are organisms or body parts that are meant to function in those um, sort of extreme conditions. The enzyme will work there because it's where it's meant to work. So keep that in mind. To find the optimal or optimum conditions of an enzyme, you can use a graph that looks like this. And usually what you will have is the enzyme function or reaction rate over here on your y-axis. And you'll have either pH or temperature on your x-axis. And then what this shows is that as pH or temperature decreases, the enzyme function also decreases because it's working at a much slower rate. And as it increases, the enzyme is working again at a much slower rate. And so that's not good either. So if you're trying to find the optimal conditions, you look at the highest point of the graph because that's where the reaction rate or enzyme function is the highest. So in this case, you would 
choose this peak of the graph, and then you would look down at the x-axis, and this temperature or pH, which is a mystery number because this graph is just a demonstration, um, would be your optimum temperature or your optimum pH. For humans, it's usually going to be body temperature is the optimal, um, and the pH is usually going to be about neutral unless it's a stomach acid um, enzyme, like pepsin works in your stomach. So I'm just going to say here that this is peak. I'm going to zoom in again. Of the graph is the optimum for the enzyme. And then you can find the value. by tracing the peak down to the x-axis. And that will give you the value of the temperature or pH that is the optimum condition. So the optimum would not be like whatever the number is on the y-axis. It would be what's on the x, the horizontal axis. And there you go. So that is enzymes and factors that affect them and how to find the optimum of an enzyme. Thanks for watching.